So I would encourage you if you're able and if you're able and, and we're able, by the way, I'm just saying if you're able uh, to, to get involved in that and to enjoy that for the next 60 days, starting on the 1st of January. But for this week, for this week, we're going to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is not necessarily a Christmas message. I came up with this message. The Lord gave me this message about a year ago. And uh, something else was going on and I wasn't able to preach it. So we're going to, we're, we're going to get into it this morning. Um, there's a lot of practical things in here for us to keep in mind here in Luke chapter 2. So let's, we'll, we'll prob we're not going to read the whole chapter. We'll read down through about the first, uh, probably the first 40 verses. It's extensive reading, but I think it'll help us. By the way, you can preach on Luke chapter 2 anytime. It doesn't have, you can preach on any part of the Bible anytime. It all fits. It doesn't necessarily have to be Christmas time, although this is the time that the text is most widely used. <clears throat> and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when, Syria, when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. <clears throat> and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born in the city, for, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you: ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, "Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill toward men." And it came to pass. As the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, notice what they said here, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see, the, see this thing which has come, come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad saying, saying which was told them concerning the child and all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them and when it was eight, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of, of the child his name was called Jesus which was, so, which was so named to the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that, every, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in, in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and, this, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And it came to pass... And he, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the, and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, 
Then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which, has, which thou hast prepared which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, and a light to lighten the Gentile, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the rising again. Notice that this child is set for the fall and for the rising again. Of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through his own, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived. With an, with an husband seven years from her virginity and she was a widow of about four score and four years which departed not from the temple and served God with fastings and prayers night and day and she coming in that instance gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for her redemption in Jerusalem verse 39 and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their, own, to, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and, and the grace of God was upon him. And we'll stop reading there. Now, we're gonna, like, like I said, we're going to get into some practical things here. The first thing that we see in verses 1 through 5, as we go back and look at verses 1 through 5, we're not going to read, we're not, we just read them, so we won't read them again. But the first thing that we see in chapters 1 through 5 is that we see a proper, we see a proper attitude toward government. We see a proper attitude toward government. Now, this was a pagan government. The Romans were in charge. And what the Romans did when they took over an area, when they took over a town or a city, they would... They, they would allow the, 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 the natives that were there, the people that were that they would allow them to, for the most part, sustain their own type and form of government. And everybody that was in charge would remain in charge as long as there were no riots. As long as there were no riots and, and nobody, what you call, upset the apple cart. And as long as they paid a hefty tax to Rome. That's pretty much the way they did it. The only time... The only time they went in and burned the city, which they did a lot, the only time they went in and destroyed a city was when there was rebellion, when the people fought. But here, so, so, so the Romans here were in charge. This was obviously a pagan government. The Romans were what you call polytheistic. Poly means many. Theistic has to do with God and religion. And, and, and so they, they, they worshipped many gods. The Jews were monotheistic. They worshipped God. They, they worshipped the Lord God Jehovah. Supposedly, but uh, so so this was a pagan government. But when it came time for them to be taxed, for them to for them to go to the city of their lineage and be taxed, what did they do? They went to be taxed. They didn't say that they didn't say, well, this is a pagan godless government, which it was, and we don't have to do what they say. That's not how they responded. Now, go to the book of go to the book of First Peter. Go to the book of 1 Peter. And look at chapter 2. <clears throat> and we'll begin reading in verse 12. Having your conversation, your way of life, your manner of living, your conduct. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now the word Gentile here is standing for the word pagan. People that aren't. People that aren't saved. People that have not been regenerated. That's the way. It's not just talking about. Because if, you, if you're a Jew. If you're, if you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. It's real easy. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what language you speak. If you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. But, but, but the, the, the word Gentile here. Is not just referring to that. 
It's referring to people who, who are unregenerate, unregenerated. A lot of times the word heathen is accompanied with Gentile in the scripture somewhere. So he said, I want you to be honest among the Gen I want you to have an honest conversation or an honest manner of life among the Gentiles that, where, that, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, that they may, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the days of visitation. And, and, and he gives a list of things to do. He said, I want you to act right among the Gentiles so when the Holy Spirit visits them, when the Holy Spirit convicts them of their lost condition, they can look at your example and they can look at you and they can know that Christ is real. By your life, they can know Christ is real. Listen, when, when, you, when you look at the way Rob Donnell conducts himself, and I'm just singling him out, when you, when, you, when you look at the way Rob Donnell conducts himself, you're going to want some of what he's got. When you look at the way David Rowan conducts himself, you're going to want some of what he's got. That's the way we ought to live. We're to be salt and light. We're to make people thirsty. And that's what he's saying here. Then he gives them a list of things to do. And notice the first thing he says. Verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Now, we can't, we can't just stop there. We can't just stop there. If they're, if they're debating something in the courts, if, if they're debating something in the courts that we know is wrong, there, there's something in the public arena that we know is wrong, as believers, as people who know the Word of God, we got to cry out against it. We got to say this is wrong and we don't want this to become a law. We don't want this to become a law. It's not right. But once it becomes a law, you submit to it unless, unless it violates the law of God. Because the same, the, the same writer who wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit also said in the book of Acts, it's better to obey God than man. But to just have a, to, to, to just have a, to, ju to just be, be ready to fight everybody, to just be ready to fight everybody is not the way to do it. It's not the way to do it. When, when it came time for them to be taxed, in Luke 2, they went to be taxed. That's what they did. They did what they were supposed to do. So, and, and, see, and see, the Bible says, the Bible says in, in, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, let your moderation be made known. Let your listen. I, I was, and of course, I've talked about this before, but I, but I was raised to be kind of an extreme guy, and I am an extreme guy. But it's but it's not. But a lot of times, it's not very effective. It's not very effective. Sometimes, if if you if you're nice and quiet and calm, when you do speak, more people listen to you. Listen, I've been in meetings with Brother Kelly. I've been in meetings with Brother Kelly, and when Brother Kelly says, I want to say something, everything stops. Everything stops till he gets through till he gets finished talking. Why? Because, because he said, because I say more words in a day than he does in a week. You know, so 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 there, there, listen, there's nothing wrong with taking a stand when it's time to take a stand. But the three Hebrew children. Listen, they defied the king's order, but they did it politely. They said, look, they probably didn't want to go in that furnace. I doubt they were itching to jump in that furnace. But they said, look, we're not trying to be difficult. We're, we're, we're not being belligerent, but this is not right. It, it's, it's not according to scripture, and we're not going to do it, and you do whatever you need to do. And, and of course, God preserved them. But sometimes this, this uh, well, I don't care what the government says. I don't, I don't care what the government says. I'm not going to do it. To defy just for the sake of being defiant. To defy just for the sake of being defiant will get you in trouble. It'll get, and this is something with, this is something about which I know a lot. To defy just for the sake of being defiant will get you in trouble. See, the, the, Mary and Joseph didn't say these bunch of Roman heathen. They got a god for they got ten gods for every day of the week. 
We don't have to do what they say. It's not what they said. And to expound on it a little bit, we shouldn't be extreme in our personal lives either. See, Romans 14 talks about standards. It talks about convictions. You know, we just got through with Christmas. And we got all these different views on Santa Claus and Christmas trees and all this stuff. Well, you know, listen, if you don't want a tree, don't have one. If, if my wife didn't put it up, we wouldn't have one. Not because I'm against them, because I'm just not going to do it. I, I, I don't care one way or the other. But, but listen, I wouldn't put up a single decoration. And, and by the way, I wouldn't do it if I could walk, because I'm just not going to climb a ladder and nail a bow to the house. I just, I don't see the point in it. But, but, but if you don't want to have a Christmas tree, don't have one. See, but Romans 14 says, Hast thou faith concerning standards? And, and this verse really got a hold of me. Con, not concerning right and wrong issues, but concerning standards. Uh, it, it says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. And then it goes on to say, Happy is the man who condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Listen, my, at my house, my kids talk about Santa Claus all the time. But they know it's a game. That, that, I mean, listen, we locked them in their room the other night and wrapped gifts. Well, we didn't. There, there's not a lock on their door. But I, I, I went to them. I said, now look. I said, anybody who touches this doorknob, with it, I, said, I said, not only can you come out of the room, you can't even touch the doorknob. I said, so if I hear the doorknob move, Without my permission, you get a spanking. I said, now, it's the day before Christmas Eve. I don't want to spank anybody. I said, so I, because they're bouncing off the walls. I said, I, I, said I, I need you fellas to pay attention. Don't come out of the bedroom. And guess what? They had to go potty every, th every three minutes. They had to go potty. So here's what, here's what I made them do. I, I made them put a blanket over, I, I said, put a blanket over your head. And walk to the bathroom and walk back, and, and they'd be coming out of the bathroom wrapped up in a, wrapped up wrapped up in a blanket, and I'd see one little eye peeking out trying to get a look at something. <laughs> but listen, when when they left the living room, there wasn't any presents under the tree. When they came back, there were presents under the tree. They know who did that. They know who did that. They know that we did that. They know Santa Claus isn't real. It's just a game we play. Somebody said. Well, where do you find Santa Claus in the Bible? You, you find him where you find Monopoly. You find him where you find Ninja Turtles and Hide and Seek and every other game that you play with your kids just for fun. That's where you find him. So, you know, we, and see, Romans talks about don't, don't go too far with this stuff. Don't, don't be too extreme with this stuff. See, see Mary and Joseph, they weren't extreme. If you got things you don't do, wonderful. I've got things I don't do. But the idea is, and see, I, I, wish that, I wish that some of this stuff had gotten a hold of me when I was 25. Because I'm extreme about everything. And, and, and even now, when my, my wife will say something. My wife will say something. And, and if I don't catch myself, if I don't catch myself, I'll begin to pontificate for 20 minutes about what all's wrong with this. And then when I get through, when I get through, I'm like, man, I should have just said nothing. I should have just not said anything. But, 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 and so we're kind of broadening the topic a little bit because not only should we not be, listen, if you got to stand against government, stand against government. I, I, I've said publicly numerous times, I do not support anything that the current administration is a part of. Chances are, unless the President of the United States were to get saved, Chances are, if he's for it, I'm against it. I don't mind saying it publicly. It doesn't bother me. But when it came time for them to be taxed, they just went and got taxed. That, they, they, just, they, just, they just went and did it. So that's number one. Number two, not, not only not, not, practical things in Luke 2 is what we're looking at. Not only that, but number two, people just went about doing their job. Listen. The world's, in a the world's in bad shape. 
All you got to do is turn on Facebook. All you got to do is turn on the news. All you got, I mean, uh, the world's in bad shape. Listen, when you, when you, when you say, when, when, when somebody who's supposed to be educated makes a comment like, we're not going to call them boys and girls anymore because that, you know, because we don't want to limit them. We're just going to say blue and pink. That's how we're going to refer to everybody. Listen, boys ought to dress like boys and look like boys and be men. And girls ought to dress like girls and, and grow up to be women. And, and make somebody a good wife. That's the way God designed it. There, there is no more lofty position anywhere. There is no more lofty position anywhere than a good godly wife. Anywhere. But but and, and so boys ought to boys ought to look like boys. Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Boys ought to look like boys and dress like boys. We, we, we and we're not going to go into detail, but there, we have certain anatomy. Everybody's anatomy is different, and, and you know which anatomy you've got, and you ought to conduct yourself accordingly. That's the way it ought to be done. But when somebody who's educated says we're not going to we're not going to say boys and girls anymore, we're going to say in school now, I'm talking about in schools, we're going to say pink and blue. Listen, if you'd have told me at 15 that I could use the girls' bathroom, that would have been a problem. I mean, I'd have just been a girl that day. I'm a girl today. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. That, 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 my point is the world's in bad shape. But you know what we got to do? We got to go about and do our jobs. We got to do what God's called us to do. Look at verse, as bad as things were, as bad as things were at this point in time in history. Look at what was going on. Go back to Luke 2 and look at verse 8. And there were in the same field shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. They were just going about doing their job. Listen, we can't sit in our, we can't sit in our rooms with the covers over our head, wondering what's going to happen. Just quit everything. We can't, we can't pray 24 hours a day and not get any work done. These shepherds, they were under captivity. The Romans had taken over. Things probably looked pretty bad, but they were just going about doing their job. Listen, you know what, you, you know what Noah did? He just did his job. God said build an ark. He wouldn't build an ark. Listen, this, I don't know what this is doing for you, but this helped me. You just go about and do what you're supposed to do. Do your job. Don't, don't, don't be always worrying about, well, what's going to happen in November around the elections? Listen, we got a nut job running for president, and I'm not going to call his name because it would surprise you what I'd say about him. So I'm not even going to call his name, but, but I, I don't know what's going to happen. But, no, but what happens in November is not my business. Other than I, I, I do what I'm supposed to do. I go vote for whoever wins the nomination. And whoever is not Hillary Clinton. I go vote. I, I, that's what I do. I raise my kids. I have family devotions. I go to church. I just do my job. These shepherds were just doing their job. That's what they were doing. Number one, proper attitude toward government. Number two, people just went about doing their job. Look at number three. I like number three. God was right where he was supposed to be. Listen, Brother, Brother Owens one gave me this idea for this message. Because about every time he preaches it, he says something to the effect of that God didn't ask anybody's permission to just show up. He didn't ask Caesar's permission to just show up. He, he went out there. Listen, why didn't he go into the throne room and say, I'm here. He didn't do that. He went out to some shepherds. He went out to some shepherds, and, and you know what? The shepherds didn't say, well, we had a vision. We're, we're more special than everybody else. They said, let's go, talk, let, let's go tell people what the Lord showed us. If you, if you read further down. But, but God, listen, God's right where he's supposed to be. Listen, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's not a second. There's not one second where God's not where he's supposed to be. Not one second. Now, I understand that we can push God out of society. As a whole, we can say, God, we don't want you. And that's pretty much what we've done as a whole in our society. We can say, God, we don't want you. You know what God does? He takes his hand away. 
See, because when you, when you reject God, you lose his safety and you lose his moral direction in society. Those are two things that you lose. See, there have always been, there's always, there, there's always been drug use and violence and pregnancy outside of marriage and, and, and all kinds of deviant sexual lifestyles. There's, there's always been these things. From the time sin entered the world, there's always been these things. But here's the difference. 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, these things existed. But they existed in the shadows. They existed in the corners. And the people that participated in these, in these type lifestyles, they were either deceived, who, they were either deceived for a period of time and, and, and they got right, or they were out and out rogues who wanted nothing to do with polite society. But now, when, whenever these things begin to be accepted as the norm, whenever, whenever they begin to be accepted as part of a, part of a quote unquote polite society, or ju it's just an alternate lifestyle. Listen, you got one wife, and that's good for you, but I've got six. I could not imagine having six wives. The, the, the very idea of it makes me break out in a cold sweat. I could not imagine having six wives. And my, and my wife could not imagine having six husbands. So it's not just me. Especially if they were all like me. But that's the new thing now. The, 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 the whole movement is starting. Certain states have already started accepting it. Where you got more than one wife. See, but God is still on the throne. He's still on the throne. Listen, when he got ready to proclaim that Jesus was here, he just went and proclaimed it. He just, he, he just, he just went right up in the middle of it and proclaimed it. So number one, these are things that should encourage us. These are things that we should keep in mind. Number one, a proper attitude toward government. Yes, we ought to rebel against government when we have to. When it violates the law of God. But until that, the Bible says to submit to every ordinance of man. And, and by the way, I didn't read the next phrase in that verse. It says, submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That's what it says. For the Lord's sake. That's number one. Number two, people are just going about doing their jobs. Number three, God is right where he's supposed to be. You know, back whenever we had the first big school shooting, well, by this point, we'd already had two or three of them, and somebody, and somebody was interviewing Billy Graham's daughter. And, and, and they got kind of smarmy with her and said, well, why do these things keep happening if, if God loves us and if, he's, and if he's in charge? And she said, she said, God's a gentleman. She said, we've asked God to excuse himself from our society. So that's what he's done. See, when God begins to take his hand away from society, you're going, to, you're going to start having problems that cannot be explained. Listen, just a few days ago, or it's, I think it's been a while now, but a seven-year-old beat a one-year-old to death for crying during his favorite cartoon. Listen, that can't be explained without bringing in spirituality. If Kevin Mills decides to shoot me for my life insurance policy, that can be explained. I, I, I had a life insurance policy that was a certain, worth a certain amount of money, and he wanted it, so he shot me. It's not, it's not right, and it puts me in a bad position, but it can be explained. The love of money is the root of all evil. It can be, but, but, when, but when you start having children that aren't even to the age of accountability, probably, committing gruesome violence against other children, against family members. And you got these child psychologists breaking their backs and racking their brains trying to figure out what's going on. You can't explain that without bringing in the spirituality, without putting it in a spiritual realm. There is no solution for it outside of that. And so I've often wondered, why doesn't somebody just say, why doesn't somebody somewhere up top just say, Okay, 
I don't necessarily agree with the theological part of the Bible. But let's put the Bibles back in schools just for the social aspect of it. J just to keep society under control. With, with all these supposed geniuses and all these deep thinkers, you think somebody would have said that. The, the, the reason they don't do it is because they want there to be a certain amount of chaos so they'll, so they'll have a reason to take over one of these days. They want there to be a certain amount of chaos. Listen, when, when God takes his hand away and you keep saying, okay, we want you to move further back, move further back, move further back, that's what's going to happen. But see, the Bible says in Colossians 1, by him all things consist. So, so when he starts lessening his influence because he doesn't violate man's free will, when he starts lessening his influence, things begin to fall apart. Like the poem says, the sinner cannot hold. Things are just going to kind of start to deteriorate. But I know this. That leads me to number four. If we look at Anna and, if we look at Anna and Simeon, number four, God's always going to have his people. Until we're raptured out, no matter how bad it gets, God's always going to have his people. Listen, there were still people waiting to witness the salvation. <coughs> Excuse me. There were still people around waiting to witness the salvation of God. As bad as it was, the most, ruth the most ruthless empire to ever exist, except for maybe Alexander the Great, was in charge. And they were bearing, they had already started bearing down and things were about to get a whole lot worse. Listen, after Christ died, after Christ grew up and died on the cross for the sins of the world, things got a whole lot worse. But they were about to crack down on believers and Christians. And it may get that way again before the rapture, I don't know. But I know this, and I can't believe I'm saying it, everything's going to be fine. You know why? Because God's got his people. God's got, God's, got, God's got positions open. By the way, God's always got some positions open for some more people. The question is, are you going to be one of his people? Or to use, to, to use a good buddies of mine phrase, are you, he, he, says I'm a, he says I'm a board member of the hand-wringing society. That's what he says about me. He says I'm a board member of the national hand-wringing society. Well, we don't need to wring our hands we don't need to worry because God's always got his people. God's right where he needs to be. What we need to do is just go about doing our jobs. Raising our families. Listen, Noah just did his job. And guess what? Every single, every single one of his children and every single one of their wives got on that ark with him. And it was at a time when the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. That's a spooky statement. The thoughts and imaginations of their heart were only evil continually. It was pretty bad here in Luke chapter 2. But Mary and Joseph, number one, they had a proper attitude toward government. Number two, people were just going about doing their jobs. Number three, God showed up when he wanted to. He was right where he was supposed to be. And number four, God's always got his people. I, I hope, I hope today... I hope today that you're one of God's people. I, ho I hope that you're saved. I hope that you've rested in the finished work of Christ. You've allowed the Holy Spirit using the Word of God to convince you that everything that needs to happen has already happened, it's already been done, and, and all you need to do is believe it. Christ has already come. He's already died for the sins of the world. He went back to heaven after being in a bar tomb for three days. And the blood is, and the blood is on the mercy seat right now. And God says, come. And we are to trust Christ and live for him. Thank you for your time. I'm going to ask Brother Rob Donnell, if you would, sir, to lift up your voice and close us in prayer.